Father, we thank you today for your amazing grace. The reality that we belong to you because of Jesus and his sacrifice. That you have included us in your family and that you love us. And Father, today we simply ask that you would open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear your word and change our lives. Change our hearts. Change our minds. Let us uh, understand how you want us to live as sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Genesis. And uh, if you uh, don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. There's some in the pews around you. Feel free to grab one of those, use it. And if you need a Bible, feel free to take one of those. We want you to have the Word of God and let it speak into your lives on a daily basis. So if you need one, take one. Uh, We are kicking off a new series today called Dysfunctional Family Tree. And if you're wondering what all those pictures are, they're pictures of uh, the staff in different poses and different years. I recognize almost uh, the one that's sitting right there closest to me and kind of going, all right, who gave it up so that my, you know, picture from when I was 18 is there. But but, uh, anyway, we're uh, we're starting in on this uh, series. We're going to be looking at it over the next few weeks. Uh, I've come to realize after 51 plus years of life and 32 years of ministry, that all families are crazy. All of them are crazy. My family's crazy. Your family's crazy. Uh, and, and we're all part of the same tree and we're all nuts on it. So, uh, and, and I hope that reality that I just called your family crazy doesn't offend you. Because uh, I know there's probably a few of you in here that are sitting here going, our family is the normal one. We're, we're normal and everybody else is strange. But uh, we all grew up thinking that, didn't we? You remember being kids, and, and, and you think your family, every other family is just like it. You know, you eat the same food, you, you do holidays the same way, everybody's got a, all this stuff, until you get a little bit older, and you start hanging out with your friends, right? And you start comparing notes, and you find out that your parents are meaner than their parents. You find out that uh, you've got more junk food at your house than they do at their house, and that people celebrate holidays differently and eat different foods and, and stuff, and you begin to find that uh, every family's crazy, And, uh, you know, and some are crazy fun, and some are crazy strange, and some are crazy painful. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a a couple of moments, because all families have their stories, and and I want you to share with the person sitting next to you one way that your family was crazy funny or crazy strange. You only got 30 seconds, so ready, set, go. You guys are having too much fun with this. So uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you that this is probably the, the favorite question I've ever asked uh, the congregation in services because every service kind of went nuts with it. Like, hey, uh, we're good now. You can just go and we'll finish the conversation. Uh, so uh, that's what lunch is for. So you guys can continue telling stories about crazy families over lunch. See, my family of origin was just kind of crazy strange. Um, you know, we, uh, the, the, one of the weird things that we did is that we moved all the time. And, and there was no reason. My parents weren't military. Everybody asked that and stuff. But when, before I was 18 years of age, I lived in 15 different houses. Yeah, see, that's crazy, isn't it? And, and, uh, and we even moved across the street and next door twice. And there's no, there's no reason for it because we weren't like, you know, in witness protection program <laughs> or, you know, fugitives, which would have been kind of cool if we were, but we just were crazy. I mean, I, I grew up thinking every family had U-Haul on speed dial. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, that, that's crazy. And, and today, I told you, we're kicking off Dysfunctional Family Tree, and, and we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph uh, starting in Genesis 37. Uh, and learning from uh, his life story and his family story. And, and uh, by the way, just in case you're wondering, there's two primary Josephs in the Bible. 
It was kind of an Old Testament Joseph and a New Testament Joseph. New Testament Joseph was the guy who was the stepfather to Jesus. You know, he married Mary, the mother of Jesus, and helped raise him. So he was kind of important, but he's New Testament. This, this Joseph we're looking at today is the Old Testament Joseph. This is like, you know, 1,500 years before Christ. So this is way back. That's why it's in Genesis, the, you know, the book of beginnings. And, and we're going to be looking at his family tree which uh, is actually the, like the starting family tree of the nation of Israel. You ever hear him talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, Jacob was Joseph's dad. And so we're going to be looking at this uh, family lineage that eventually gets to Jesus. So these are Jesus' ancestors that we're talking about. This is the founding family of Israel. And, and so we're, this, we're going to begin with the story of Joseph's family, which is a story of dysfunction. Uh, it is a really messed up family uh, in just about every way that you look at it. And by the way, i got to explain this. Uh, Joseph's dad was Jacob, but God changed his name to Israel. So this literally is the family that the nation gets its name from. And, and this is where it begins. So I want you to see how messed up, how dysfunctional Joseph's family was. First of all, it was a blended family. Genesis 37, uh, beginning in verse 1, says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Uh, Did you catch that? Father's wives, plural. Because Jacob had four wives at the same time. We're not talking about one after the other. We're talking about four women living in the house, in the camp, in the family estate together. And between them, they had 12 sons. That's messed up. Okay, you think your family, blended family is weird or strange. This, this place was crazy. And, and uh, here's the thing. Two of the wives were sisters. Yeah, it's getting weirder, right? And, and so they're sisters, and, and Jacob favored one over the other, but somehow they got into a baby-making competition because that was where the value was back then. And and so each of them took their handmaiden and gave him as a wife to to their husband. So uh, we're talking about really, really dysfunctional. And Joseph had ten older half-brothers and then one younger brother. So it's a blended family, and Jacob the dad showed favoritism, really bad favoritism. Continue, verse 3. Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Uh, By the way, parents, don't show favoritism. It really is going to bring dysfunction into your family. But since I just said that, how many of you were the favorite child of your parents? (laughs) Like, Like... Thanks for the honesty. How many of you had siblings that were the favorite child of your parents? Yeah. Now, this kind of favoritism isn't like the kind that you argue about over Thanksgiving dinner about who was mom's favorite and all that kind of stuff, and you laugh about it. Uh, This was really dysfunctional because Joseph, uh, uh, Jacob was upfront about the fact that he loved Joseph more than the others. And he favored him with this coat that his brothers didn't get. And, and that led to this extreme sibling rivalry. Uh, extreme, and we're talking about crazy here. So if you, haven't, if you don't know this story, hang on. This takes a wild turn. It starts with Joseph's dreams. Uh, verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. Ah, How do you like that? His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers. And said, Behold, I dreamed another dream. (laughs) Behold, the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow ourselves to the ground before you? Uh, I don't think Joseph was real smart. 
You know, because his brothers already don't like him because dad likes him better. And he has this dream, and, and he tells, tells him this dream that, hey, you guys are going to have to serve me and bow down to me. Uh, I had two older brothers, and, and uh, you know, if I'd said something like this to them, they would have pinned me to the ground, you know, put their uh, knees in my chest, drooled in my face, and tortured me. Wait, they did that, and I didn't tell them dreams like this. So, <laughs> so you know, he knows his brothers already hate him. And, and he's rubbing their noses in it. So you got one of two choices. Either Joseph is clueless. I mean, he's just dumb as a rock because he's, he's doing this to guys who already hate him. Or he's an arrogant jerk who's rubbing their noses in it. Either way you go with it, uh, he's not the best or the brightest uh, of the bunch. So because he shares these dreams with his brothers who already hate him, uh, they plotted to kill him. Seriously, they planned to kill him. Jump down to verse 18. Uh, Jacob sends Joseph out to check on his brothers. And, and we already know that he kind of, you know, tells on him. He's a snitch. And, and uh, here's what it says. It says, they saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of these pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. And we will see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, Reuben's the oldest, by the way, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So Joseph came to his brothers, and they stripped him of his robe and the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So they actually plotted to kill him. But Reuben, who's the oldest and who wanted his dad's favor, decides that he's going to get it by uh, betraying his brothers. <laughs> Again, I told you it was dysfunctional. And uh, rescue Joseph and take him back and look like the good guy. Uh, but they actually planned to kill him. That's pretty messed up. But instead of killing him, they only sold him as a slave. Story continues. Verse 25. So then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum and balm and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? It's always a capitalist in the midst, right? So come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. All right, a little bit of confession here. How many of you ever teased your uh, little brothers or sisters about selling them? <laughs> All right, I see a few of those hands. Okay, that, you know, how many of you were ever cruel enough to like, tell your little brothers and sisters, well, you're not really part of the family. We found you on the porch or out by the dumpster. <laughs> yeah. See, that's just moderate cruelty. But Joseph's brothers actually sold him into slavery. And they took his coat and they, and they killed an animal and, and sprinkled the blood on it and took it back to dad and said, your son is dead. Is this his coat? And, uh, and Jacob thought Joseph was dead. Now we're going to pause the story here. Next week it is to be continued. And we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph these next four weeks and learning about family, dysfunctional family, and our families and how God can redeem. So let's move on to the story of our families. Uh, by the way, if you can't stand the, uh, to figure out how the story ends, go ahead and read from Genesis 37 on through Genesis 50. It'll tell you, and you can see the ending. Uh, but we're going to talk for a little bit about our families because the stories of the families in Scripture are there for us to learn from them. God wants us to understand some things about our families and about how we relate. So here's some things I think we can learn from this story. First of all, God uses dysfunctional people raised in dysfunctional families. God uses messed up people who were raised in messed up families. I mean, you're not going to find very many households that are more dysfunctional than the one that God used to establish an entire nation and bring the Messiah into the world than the family of Jacob, the one that Joseph grew up in. So don't think that because your family was crazy painful or crazy addicted or even crazy evil that God can't use you for his kingdom or for his glory. In fact, if you read the Bible, you discover that other than Jesus, pretty much everyone that God uses was messed up. 
I, I mean, they just were dysfunctional completely. So I share this with you because I want to be really clear. Your past does not disqualify you from serving God. Your past does not disqualify you from being loved by God. And, and your past does not disqualify from God from using your life in significant ways for his kingdom. Okay, I want you to know that. Because God loves to redeem broken people and broken families. That's what he does. And, and you'll see that in the story of Joseph. So if you believe that because of your past abuse or addiction or promiscuity or divorce or lawlessness or criminal record or lies or unethical behaviors that God can't or won't use you for his glory, think again. Think again. Because God delights in redeeming broken lives. So God uses dysfunctional people raised in dysfunctional families. I also want you to see that all parents bless and curse their children. Uh, no one's going to nominate Jacob for father of the year. We already looked at the dysfunction of his, his uh, marital situation and the dysfunction of the way he showed favoritism and, and all this kind of stuff. But he did bless his kids. He gave them some gifts that were significant in their lives uh, and, and made a difference for them. Most of all, he, you know, he had a living, breathing relationship with God. He wrestled with God and, and his kids came to know God. Especially Joseph. So we all bless and curse our kids. And, and we see that in this family. And it's true in our family. So let me just go ahead and kill the myth of perfect parents. Okay? Because some of you, especially if you got little ones, your goal, your dream, your, your target is to be the perfect parent. You want to be a perfect mom, perfect dad. You, and, and it's not going to happen. You're going to bless your children and you're going to curse your children. Because you're a sinner. That's what happens. We, we all do that to our kids. And while we're on the subject of perfection, don't raise your kids to try and be perfect kids because they're not going to be. <laughs> Sorry if that offends you. You know, your kids aren't perfect. None of our kids are perfect because they're born into a sinful world and they learn very quickly, don't they? Right? Because it didn't take them long before they start acting out of their defiance and saying no. <laughs> right? By the time they're two, you can see sin all over them. Even if they don't understand it yet, it's there. And so, you know, don't burden your kids with trying to make sure they're perfect and the best at everything. Just let them be who God made them to be. And, and you don't have to be a perfect parent. Because every one of us was blessed and cursed by our parents. And every one of us will bless and curse our children. And, and what we need to do is we need to know what that is. We need to name it. Identify it. So that we can break the curses and increase the blessings. See, we need to do that. Uh, my parents bless me. I, I, I'm, you know, there's tons of blessings. I could tell you all, lots of them. Let me just share a couple with you. My parents bless me by teaching me a, a great work ethic, <laughs> even though I didn't want to learn it. Uh, and uh, they taught all of us how to work, and they took work seriously, and, and so we learned a work ethic. My parents gave me a great faith foundation. I, I mean, you know, I grew up in a family with a drug problem. They drug us to church Sunday morning. They drug us to church Sunday night. Wednesday night, if there was uh, special meetings, we were there all the time. But my parents loved God, and they introduced me uh, to Jesus. My parents uh, blessed me by giving me an example of a committed, loving marriage. Those are all blessings that are in my life today. Uh, my parents also cursed me. Uh, one of the most painful ones was the fact that growing up, they hung the label on me of being lazy. They called me the lazy one. I, and, and I can't tell you how many times that, that they referred to me as the lazy one. You're just lazy. And, and, and the reason I was lazy is because I wanted to play. Okay, I just admit that. I understand that. And I get it now. And I not just wanted to play, but I wanted to make work fun. And since my parents taught this work ethic, I had lots of opportunities to try and take those chores and make them fun. And that didn't sit well with my parents because they didn't know how to have fun, not back then. And so uh, I got labeled lazy, and, and you know what? Uh, uh, never really been lazy in my life, but on those days off, still to this day, uh, that accusing voice in my head sometimes will tell me that I'm being lazy and I need to get to work. See, that, that, that's, a, that's one of those curses that I carry with me. Uh, my parents also cursed me with pride. Maybe not like you're thinking, because they never told me that I was better than anyone else. Uh, because they made sure that I understood that no job was beneath me, <laughs> and I did a lot of those. But, uh, but they gave us a, a pride uh, of basically 
never wanting to ask for help. Right? We're going to do it ourselves. We're not going to take any charity, and we're not going to let other people help us, even if we need it. And that really sabotages you in life because we all need help. We all are weak at times, and we need that hand up. The other thing, that, and this one was just crazy, is my parents had that pride where they, they really wanted us to keep everything secret. I don't know if you've had this thing, but, you know, there's like, don't tell other people our business. Don't, don't, don't tell them what goes on in our house. Don't tell them what goes on in our family. And, and over and over they'd say, don't tell people how much I make. I was a kid. I had no idea what they made in, in their salary. I'm like, okay, I can do that. I don't know what you make. You know, it's not like they were opening up the books for me. And, and, uh, and, and here's the crazy thing about that whole secrets. Our family was boring. We didn't have any good secrets. I mean, they wouldn't even make a documentary about my family. Uh, it was so boring. Unless they want to do it on, you know, why they moved all these times. So, you know, we had nothing to hide. Of course, God got even with them. I became a preacher, and I could tell all the stories about our family. So, <laughs> so Mom, if you're listening to this sermon on tape, uh, you know, sorry. Uh, still got to forgive me. But, but can you identify how your parents blessed you and how they cursed you? Can, can you figure that out? And, and by the way, if you think about the curses and you get angry, then, then talk with someone because you don't want to carry that anger around. This is a, a learning exercise so that you can choose to break the curses. If you don't identify the curse, you know what's going to happen? You're going to pass it down to your kids. See, that's what, ha- that's what it means in Scripture when it says the sins of the fathers are visited upon the children. It's not that God's being mean. It's just that we pass down those curses to the next generation, unless we identify it and say, I'm not going to do that. And and so uh, identify those so that you can break the curses and choose to bless more. And and then can you identify how you blessed and cursed your kids? You know, if they're little and they're still at home, then then, uh, don't worry about it. you got time to redeem that. But if they're grown and you're not sure how you cursed them, I dare you to ask them. They're probably not afraid of you anymore if they don't live under your roof. So they, they might tell you. And here's the thing. If you can identify how you cursed your kids, apologize. Just say, I'm sorry that I taught you that. Because that will help them heal and help them to identify and break those curses on the next generation. See, this is one of the things we can learn from this family. Is that all parents bless and curse their children. And our goal is to want to bless more. Bless more than we curse. Finally, last thing I want you to see in in this is that if you lead your family toward God, God will redeem your family. Lead your family toward God and God will redeem your family. Uh, You're going to see this as the life of Joseph, Joseph unfolds. God does amazing works in his family and in his life and brings them uh, to a place of, of complete redemption. And so I'm going to challenge you to lead your family toward God so that God can redeem your family. And, and here's what it looks like. If God is a priority for you, if he's real in your life and you've got a vibrant relationship with God, then there's a good chance that your kids are going to be influenced positively to follow Christ. But if Religion and church are important to you. It it may not be a positive influence in your kid's life. And and if God is an afterthought to you, if he's just someone that when you're in trouble you call on or, you know, visit a few times a year, then your kids probably aren't going to be led toward him. They may find him on their own, but it's not going to be because you blessed them with that faith foundation. Uh, So lead your family toward God. What does that look like to lead your family toward God? Uh, it means that you talk about your faith with your kids or with your grandkids and how God has changed you and how God's changing you now. It means that you have those conversations of faith uh, with your children so that they understand what you believe. By the way, don't you want to have that conversation? Don't you want to instill your values in your kids? Talk to them about the things that are important to you because if you don't have that conversation, somebody else will and who knows what they believe. And so talk about your faith. Let your children, if they're at home, let them catch you reading the Bible and praying. What a great thing to do. And, and, and here, try this out. If you've got little ones at home, read the Bible with them and pray with them. Let that be part of your routine, your normal uh, day-to-day operations of life. 
And, and, and I'm going to say this, guys, don't let it just be a mom thing. The kids, if you want to lead them toward God, they need to see dad involved in this spiritual endeavor. They need to know that God is important to you because if not, at some point, they're going to go, well, if God's not really important to dad, I don't really have to take him seriously either. You've got a lot of influence. So lead them that way. And then as they get older, serve together. Do missions together. I mean, we give you all kinds of opportunities here locally and, you know, day trips and things like that. Uh, you know, serve with your kids. Let them know that you want to make a difference in other people's lives. And, and, and honestly, I'm just going to challenge you. If you've got kids still at home, do a mission trip together. One of the big ones. Take them someplace where you can serve for a week. You know, take them someplace exotic. I know it costs a lot of money, but so does Disneyland. <laughs> so instead of taking them to Disneyland one year, why don't you take them to Thailand? That'll rock their world. Hey, that was one of the best decisions I made taking my kids on mission trips. It, God changed their lives in ways I never could have. And, and, and so I'm just telling you, it's worth the investment. And I know it's crazy expensive. I, I, trust me, I know that. But you know what? Here's what happened is, is friends and relatives will give so your kids can go. You only end up paying for yourself. That's how it works. So, you know, plan on doing these kinds of things because if you lead your family toward God, God will redeem your family. And some of you are going to go, but how's God going to redeem our family? You know, we've got brokenness and we've got issues and we've got all these things. Look, here's the truth. I don't know how God's going to redeem your family. He'll do it however he chooses. However he chooses to work in your life and in your family's life, life he'll redeem. But see, in Joseph's life, his family was crazy dysfunctional, and he went through a lot of pain and a lot of hurt and a lot of hardship. But in the end, God did an incredible story of redemption. I imagine that your life will be a lot like that too. That there's going to be pain, there's going to be hardship, there's going to be sorrow. But in the end, you'll see God's redemption if you don't give up on God. If you don't give up on God. Because God always redeems and he loves to surprise his children. So today, are you a child of God? Are you in his family? And by that I mean if you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus is the son of God, the savior of the world. You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead. And you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Because if you haven't, then you're not in the family and God's blessings, his redemption isn't promised to you. And I'd encourage you to take that step. In fact, at the end of the service, there's going to be people here at the front, part of our prayer team. And, and, and they'd be glad to talk with you and pray with you and start that relationship with Jesus Christ. Because all you have to do is ask and say, God, I want to be in your family. And he's waiting for you. But if you're in the family, if you know Christ, if you're his, are you leading your family toward God? Because if you're not leading your family toward God, you're leading them away from him. Let's pray. Father, thanks for including us in your family. It is such a joy to be sons and daughters of God and to have that promise of redemption in this world and heaven to come. And Lord, this morning we simply commit ourselves to you again, asking that you would work in our families. God, help us to see the blessings, help us to break the curses, and help us to lead our Husbands, our wives, our children, our grandchildren toward you, that they might step into your place of blessing and redemption as well. Most of all, we want to honor you with our lives. Wherever we've come from, God, we want to honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.